Welcome on Fair and Square. Our guest today is Paul Wallace, Professor Emeritus, University of Missouri, USA. He's a specialist on Indian politics, particularly Punjab. Welcome on Fair and Square, Professor Paul Wallace. Thank you, Kushwar. You, you're considered a, an expert on Punjab, and you've been coming to Punjab since 1963. That's a long time. <laughs> yes, but you know, I'm intrigued that why Punjab out of all the things? What made you, you know, look at Punjab? It was a matter of choice. Uh, I came to, first came to India with a student group from the University of California, Berkeley. And that's when I got interested, really, in India and in South Asia. And then I did my master's degree, et cetera. And when it came to doing my PhD, I needed a dissertation topic. And it had to be in India. And so I selected Punjab because it was the most interesting state. And it was one physically I could go around rather than something like Uttar Pradesh, which was much, much too big. So when you say interesting, what was the interesting bit? I mean, what interested you? At that you? point in time, I was interested in internal political dynamics. And we were studying, a group of us used to meet for coffee. And uh, we had an informal seminar. And we focused our theater theoretical concerns around factionalism that is the internal workings of political parties and how that relates to democracy. So my first interest in Punjab was the, you had the fact that there were two different religions and there had been a third before partition and that still had a, a residual effect. Uh, and that within the Congress party, there was a factional system that operated then. And how did that relate to democratic politics because Already by the 1960s, India was very notable for its democratic politics. I and mean, we've just finished an election here this month. And India is the very largest democracy in the world. So it's been all, almost, what, 51 years since you've been coming to Punjab? Which is almost impossible, because I'm only 39. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't understand your calculation, but or no, obviously no, you've I've got been, your... Obviously I've been you've, coming for 50 years, yes. Yes, 50 years. but. Uh, what are the changes you've seen? I mean, I mean, the changing contours of Punjab's politics of Punjab since 63 till 2014. Well, there's always been political movements in Punjab. And who occupies the gutty, the, the, the controls the legislative assembly and the politics has always been a central thrust of politics. But that includes the, each of the political parties as well as the larger context within that, with which that takes place. And when I first started coming, the Congress party was dominant. Uh, and that's because there was a Hindu majority in uh, Punjab at that point. Uh, but the Sikhs uh, had mounted a Punjabi Suba movement to create a Sikh majority state. I won't go into the complexities of that because they had to put it on a language basis. But was that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, I think it was a good idea because the six were only 2% of India's population, the only 2% now. But they wanted a majority in an area so they could use Punjabi language, have Punjabi identity, hopefully not at the cost of others. And that's eventually how it worked out because Punjabi Suba led to the trifurcation of Punjab with two districts in Himachal, going to Himachal, and Haryana. But if you look at it, I mean, it was divided on linguistic lines, like you're mentioning. Largely in linguistic lines. So would Punjab, if, in terms of Punjab, you know, if we talk about today, would Punjab be in a more progressive state if Punjab hadn't been divided? Anything is possible. But what struck me was everybody spoke Punjabi. Uh, I used to sit in the, in the Vidhan Sabha, in the Legislative Assembly. And I'd listen to all of these speeches and so on. Then I'd go talk to my friends in the, the library of the Vidhan Sabha. And I would say, how do you tell the difference between so-and-so who's speaking in almost chaste Hindi and somebody speaking, no, who, who, who you record in chaste Hindi and somebody you record in Punjabi? Because they're speaking the same to me. They said, oh, yes, they're all speaking Punjabi, but they want to be recorded. In, in, in a different language. So they all communicated well. That's very important. They had close relations. Uh, they had coffee together and tea together. Uh, they had the MLA flats. But would Punjab have 
benefited if it hadn't been divided, for example, if linguistic bases were not the criteria because, no, for I example... No, I think there was a benefit to the whole region. And I think you have to take a regional approach because southern Punjab, which is now Haryana, was the backward part. It was sort of an extension. But for example, you have, water, you have water in Himachal and agriculture right. in Punjab, but you've divided a state on linguistic basis. But you're still one, one nation, one state. You're still India. And right. that's, that's the real thrust of, the, of what's needed and continuing to be needed in India. That one goes across these state lines as you go across religious lines, across caste lines, across all those elements that make up politics. So either politics politics is disuniting and that happens and that's a problem or it's unifying so politics is the problem but it's also the answer so Punjab's politics was what unifying or dividing no I think ultimately it's unifying because with the creation of Punjabi Suba in 1966 there are still two major political parties that were contesting and within those political parties there were three, actually, because the John Sung operated at that time as a party for urban Hindus. And that did not resolve the problems of political problems of Punjab. But then later, once the John Sung and Sri Mani Akali Dal came together in an alliance, you had a group that one constituency or support base were urban Hindus, and the Sikhs were rural Sikhs. And they could cooperate. They had to cooperate to contest against the Congress, which included both communities. So that was integrative because you have competition now and you need competition in politics. And it's good to have alteration of parties. Now, I don't want to be quoted when any one party is in power because that says the other party should come to power. But in retrospect, when you look back, having competition so that the opposition is criticizing and examining is healthy sure, for like, the system. Like, yeah, it's like healthy. anywhere in the world. But how have you seen the politicians change? How, what, how do you rate the political class of Punjab, say in 2014 in this era, and how, when we, you were coming? Well, there's a metaphor that perhaps I could use. In the early elections, uh, there was a statement that, uh, as a voter, I'm approached by the different political parties and they want to give me something. Uh, so I will vote for whoever gives me the most. Uh, next election, the metaphor is, I'm approached by different political parties and they all give me something, uh, then I consider who I vote for. And then succeeding elections, they all give me something, but then I select another criteria. How is it for my children? What is it for education? Am I getting water? Uh, is to power six hours or 10 hours a day. Uh, so there are a number of other criteria that come into play. In short, over time, the voter has become much more sophisticated, much more. But the political person, what about the political person? Has he become more sophisticated? Yes, absolutely more sophisticated because it's not simply you go and you give speeches in villages or you provide something for them and what you provide may differ between elections, but uh, you provide something for them and you come and you see them only at times of elections, really, and then you go back and you engage in your politics. Now, there's pressure. Uh, the term that we use in political science is civic culture, that the voter now has different interests around which they organize and they're continually putting pressure on their representatives. But Professor Wallace, uh, this particular election, you would be aware, drug became, drugs became the center stage. So obviously, and a lot of politicians are being alleged to be involved in this trade. Mm -hmm. So where has the political class improved? Well, first of all, there's, there's more transparency now. And there's more means of obtaining transparency. Uh, here we're on a television program and we could talk about it. Uh, there's the print media, there's the social media, and there's the civic culture of people who are concerned about their, their children, uh, about their relatives, and those who are just concerned about Punjabi society. And in this election, it took an election to highlight the problem. And that's a function of elections. 
what are the problems and what can we do about so, it? And that's been highlighted now. And some of the corruption that's being alleged also is coming out. You go into a village, you find certain kinds of drug paraphernalia and so on. So the politician has kind of not improved. He's only kind of deteriorated. No, I don't think they've deteriorated. Now, as a politician, has to be responsive. If he's not responsive, he's voted out. And Kali Dal, in two years ago, came to power in an election. And Do you think Punjab is a case of electing the lesser evil? Not really. Uh, no politics is perfect. So when you look around and you see you have politicians who are alleged to be corrupt or may not have the qualifications that you desire, uh, you develop a negative attitude. Uh, but by and large, the politician is better educated, they're more involved, uh, they have better linkages to the center, they have better linkages to the villages and rural areas and to the cities. So the system is much more complex now. It's not just villages that are far away or cities that are not concerned about sanitation or education. Uh, when I first came here, uh, there were open drains in the cities and the uh, amenities were minimal and the politicians uh, were part-time politicians. Do you think, do you think the, in, the Punjabi voter today, how do you rate the Punjabi voter today? Has he, he, has he improved or deteriorated? Has he become more corrupt, greedy, or has he become more mature? One thing I've always noticed about Punjabis, they're very critical, they're very negative. They don't say, how has the voter improved? How is the politician better? No. Is he more corrupt? Is he less able? So, on. so I'm used to that. Uh, and in my opinion, the voter and the politicians have improved. Now, does that mean everything is running nicely? No. You have crisis. You have problems. And in this particular election, uh, we not only have the uh, Bharatiya, Jan the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, and the Kali Dalit Alliance against the Congress, but we had a new entrant into, into the picture, the Ahmed Bin Party. And the AAP brought in another element that made this election different, and not just in terms of the outcome that they got four seats, but this is a response to the fact that the people were not so happy with the ruling but company, you, but not so happy with the opposition. And that makes the ruling party and the opposition have to change in certain ways. They have to recognize problems like the drugs, the sale of sand, at least that's what the papers have been emphasizing. I don't do the investigative journalism to say how true it is about the drugs, how true it is about the sound, but the perception is clear. What, what do you think about the up concept in Punjab in the sense the AAP's dom AAP has dominated this election in Punjab. It's been routed all over India. Is, it, is this phenomena going to stay in Punjab? Well, it's part of a worldwide movement. The AAP party is not just uh, a phenomena in India. We had the Arab Spring that uh, reacted in Tunisia and in Egypt and the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. And we had movements all over the world that as a consequence of a, but a movement, better communication. But our movement started from Delhi. It had, in no, the no, sense No, I know that, that but, but the Anahazari movement about corruption, for which op then uh, is, a, is a growth, uh, this is part of a worldwide movement that people that are saying people in the grassroots now want more participation, and they have higher expectations of their politicians. That's good. And that's what the, um, the AAP is, is saying. Now, I don't consider them a full political party. They're more like a political movement. And they have elected four people here in Punjab. It's their only MPs in do India. You, do you think Punjab bucks the trend usually, what the national trend is? If not you were really, to not really. Uh, this, this time, you had a, 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 an unusual situation. Because uh, there was a Modi wave, but it wasn't visible in Punjab. Right, but there were two anti-insurgency, anti-incumbent movements in Punjab. One was anti-incumbent in terms of the a Kali Dal BJP combined, and the other was against the Congress party that comes down nationally. And if you're a voter, you say, do I want this party or that party? And neither of one is really satisfactory to me. But they had another option, which was the AAP. So the Adadmi party 
benefited from that. So you but think that's an unusual situation. So Punjab, uh, so in Punjab, AAP became the new NOTA? Yes. That's what you think? Yes. They became, for this election, now whether in the next election, which will be an assembly election, they will have such an impact, we'll see. But I, I, Punjab is not separate from the rest of India. And so the same currents that flow, but the dynamics in Punjab at any one point in time may be different. So with the three parties and two parties to some extent being discredited or two groups being discredited, the Adadmi had space, political space, in which they could move and, and do very well with four MPs. That's incredible. Nobody predicted that. 51 years you know, of experience in Punjab politics. How have you seen the women evolve or you know, how, the role of the women in Punjab's politics and Punjab space. What do you, what do you have to say on that? No, Punjab, Punjabi women have always been, I was going to use the term assertive, but their own identity as a person, not just as a wife and a mother. When I first came here, it was so common that a woman was known by, as her husband's wife, as the child's mother. And that's still true, and it's very important. I'm not, gee, if I, if I demean that, uh, they, would, they would decapitate me. <laughs> right, yeah. So They're assertive. <laughs> but they're also going into professions. They're going into uh, uh, all kinds of activities now that really were not available except for very few during that period of time. And India is very exceptional in this, too, in the freedom movement, the independence movement, there are really outstanding women that, that had a role. But in have, the they found, uh, have they found you know, a space in the political domain? Yes, they have. Indira Gandhi is the most obvious. But if you look, this is 2014. And if you, if you look at India, you have Mamata Banerjee in West Bengal, Jayalitha. But particularly in so, Punjab, you know, if I were to talk about Punjab. Well, we, there's one MP from Punjab who's in the union cabinet now and she's a woman. Mr. Prakash Singh Badal, who's the present chief minister of Punjab, right. this is his fifth tenure. Right. Do you think there is a Badal doctrine that's dominated in the state politics for the last 40 years or so? Not 40 years, because uh, 1995, Beyond Singh was assassinated. And Prakash but Singh, he's been around from 69. Yeah, he's been around. And uh, with the end of the Khalistan movement, what I think what Prakashing Bottle's major contribution was coming into alliance with the BJP so that you had urban Hindus and rural Sikhs combining, each maintaining their support base and having a parity then with the Congress Party. Well, when that operates efficiently, they actually have a majority. But there is a view that maybe inertia has set in the state. Do you think that view is true? Because of this doctrine, any time a political party is in office for a long time, there is a complacency that sets in, and uh, I hesitate to, to say this, but they they are the rightful rulers, and that's when the opposition has its real opportunity, and that's when the opposition should should be effective, because for a political party to be successful, it always has to be pushed. That's the nature of democratic politics. And Punjab on the whole has been very successful with that. Now, there are problems in the economy in Punjab that are very serious in terms of water, in terms of... Where does Punjab stand today, actually, if you compare it back to 1953? What do you think of Punjab today? Well, with the Green Revolution, which comes after 1963, uh, but shortly after that, Punjab led in all indicators. It had the highest rural per capita income. Uh, it's provided the most to the central uh, food supply. Sure. Uh, and, and any number of indicators, I had about 10 or 12 indicators in an article I wrote at that time, uh, that it led the nation. But it's, today, it's what, fallen in 2000, behind yeah, 2014, what do you think of Punjab? 2014 has fallen behind. The Green Revolution needs a second Green Revolution in terms of the kind of crops that are grown, the kind of irrigation that is there, these factors have all been identified. It's not that I have any special knowledge, but I do look at almost everything related to Punjab that I can. And these factors have been identified. And certain steps have been started. 
but it does need more push. This is where the political system. What do you think is the biggest threat to Punjab today? The In biggest threat is the agricultural sector. Because with the agricultural sector having weakened, and weakened in some areas considerably, uh, you have a drug problem, there is the farmer suicides, uh, and uh, the, the kinds of problems that come when the, uh, the economy is not holding its own. So Punjab has gone downhill a little bit. And it, it has the basis in terms of the hardworking Punjabi farmer, in terms of the talented uh, Punjabi urban as well as ruralites to really go ahead. I remember when I first came to Punjab, Pratap Singh Karan, who was chief minister, he had a special officer in Sector 17. It was an office that nobody knew about, really. But being a researcher, I found out. And he and his industries minister used to sit together in that office and plan industrialization of Punjab. Uh, now, that still hasn't really come about. But there is talk about value added for agricultural product. Punjab has been successful in agriculture. But it must have more diversification of agriculture. And as the union minister for, from Punjab now says, uh, value the processing of those well, agricultural Well, I, I, I hope that works you know, in Punjab's favor, what you're indicating. But that's not new in terms but of the conceptualization. But to do it, Punjab I also want to you know, uh, take your attention to the Sikh diaspora. Mm. What has been the Sikh diaspora's role in developing Punjab? Their, uh, you know, whole journey from, say, the 60s when this diaspora started growing till now. Well, the diaspora comes in, in, in where I was raised in California in the 1920s and 30s. And I had a PhD student who finished his PhD with me, Jagdeep Chima, uh, who's third generation Sikh. His grandfather walked across Mexico into California, uh, and his father is uh, successful, grows Alban, has Alban Groves, and is a counselor in a high school. And Jagdeep is now a PhD teaching in an American university. Yeah, the Sikh diaspora's role in Punjab, now, in developing Punjab. This is a part of California where Jagdeep comes from, where there are over 5,000 families in this one town of Yuba City. Stockton, California, which is close, has even more six. So there are large numbers of them. And they keep in contact with Punjab. They have relations here. They marry uh, here. Uh, and they bring in funds into Punjab. And they bring in new kinds of knowledge into Punjab. Do you think they've influenced the narrative in Punjab? Oh, I think there's a, there's a mutual influence. Absolutely. Uh, every election. If you go down to the, wor the, the level of campaigning, you'll find some Sikhs and some Hindus are coming from the United States, from Canada, and the South Hall section of London, uh, three major areas of the diaspora. And they're working in elections, helping friends, helping relatives. They're contributing funds. Uh, you have Punjabis who are, have relatives in the United States. Uh, and there's that interaction that takes place. Uh, in fact, expressions that I, I learned about in the United States have come first from Punjab. Uh, oh no, oh no. I think the time lag that used to take place between finding out what happens in one country, that gets shorter and shorter. And now with the social media and smartphones and everything else, uh, there's almost instantaneous communication. So the world is growing smaller. And Punjabis have always been adventuresome. They have incredible entrepreneurs. And they're not just sex, they're no longer rural, just rural. They're in all the professions, the transport, and in all the areas. And see, I don't see this as Hindu and Sikhs. I see this Punjabis. Punjabis, absolutely. And Punjabiat is a real term. And it really does deal with Punjabi culture and the foods, the expressions, and the humor. How, pers Punjabi. personally for you, personally for you, how has this whole Punjabi experience of yours enriched you? I'm part Punjabi. I can't help it. I've been here so many times and spent so much time you here. Can, you, have you picked up some of the expletives? <laughs> well, <laughs> I wear a honeymoon give, given to me by a Punjabi. 
Yes, you have that locket there. In yeah. fact, I was going to ask you about it's that. It's not a locket. It's a, it's a straight Hanuman. Yes, it's a, it's, it's a Hanuman locket. Not a locket, but a okay. pendant. A pendant, yeah. Right. So and it was given to me by a Punjabi. His wife had given it to him when he went overseas the first time and said it would bring him back from the dark waters. And we have been very good friends. And so he gave it to me to bring me back safely to the U.S. And it did that. And it's been moving me back and forth ever since. Thank you, Professor. So Thank wonderful you. to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. खबरों की दुनिया में आइए हमारे साथ कहीं भी और कभी भी जुड़िए हम मिलेंगे फेसबुक पर हम दिखेंगे यूट्यूब पर हमें फॉलो कीजिए ट्विटर पर खबरों के साथ बने रहिए रात दिन